Very warm welcome to another video as I celebrate 40 years of overland travel and overland content creating. This piece of work I'm rather proud of it was my first television show that was not made up of existing material that I had shot for training videos, DVDs and things. It was pure television. My hero at the time was Michael Palin and he was doing lovely shows, shows like Pole to Pole and uh, Pacific Rim and others. And I think you'll see a little bit of uh, uh, Palin-esque presentation here, but it was my chance to become a TV explorer. It was made in 2006 and I traveled with writer, lecturer on the Kalahari, Mike Main. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. It's 2024. That means 40 years that I've been exploring the world's most remote places in four-wheel drives in association with the Overland Workshop. There's something about this kind of travel in Botswana that I absolutely love. You don't really need to follow a road on these pans when the waters come. It obliterates all the, all the tracks. The glare is unbelievable. It's something about the Botswana part of the Kalahari that is so unique. You can see a number of groups of cattle, a couple of wells. We're going to explore those now. See, there's another well over there. The women are doing that well. This is Botswana. This is a part of Botswana that time has kind of left behind. We're uh, lucky enough also to be here with a man who has spent most of his life lecturing and writing about Botswana and the Great Kalahari, and that is Mike Main. And uh, we're very lucky to be here. There's life in old Botswana for you. I know, isn't that wonderful? Isn't it great? Yeah. <laughs> what you're going to find, particularly with this game around uh, the game areas, you'll find that the, the animals will scrape away the pan surface, right at the, the, the deepest part of the pan, the lowest part of the pan. We're talking about marginal distance differences, a few centimeters, but there will be a point, the last place where water will lie. And that's right. where you'll find the game, scraping at the sand with their hoofs. And you'll see a hole about this size. Yeah. And they eat it. They actually eat the, the, the content because it's got trace elements in it. Because this is the end point of an inland drainage system. You've got to see it that way. So this is, this is where, if, if, it ever, if there's ever runoff, this is where it goes. And with the runoff goes all the trace elements, all the nutrients that dissolve in water. So this, this is a catchment place for all the, the uh, nutrients. Hence, around a pan like this, you will find greater um, biodiversity than anywhere else in the Kalahari. There are more different plant species within a kilometer of this pan than there are anywhere else in the Kalahari. So that's why the game comes here, because there's the possibility of water when, when in the rainy season. There's the certainty of trace elements that they need because the nutrients are not great in the grass. And finally, there's more different plants around here than any of us. Now, hence, when you go into the, the part of the Kalahari that we're going to go into, um, you see a lot of, uh, uh, you, you see quite a lot of game always around the pan. That's where you go to see game. It's easy to see them and they're all there because there's lots of things they want. These things are incredibly important in the whole ecology of the Kalahari yeah. and its development. Let's go and have a look and see, have a closer look. I see they're, I see they're using reem, rimpies made, I think they call them rimpies made from the skin of cows. Oh, the, the rope. Yeah. It's, it's not yeah, worth it. Yeah, I see that. Uh, and they're all covered with wood like this. is exactly the way that, that, that they've done it. How are you doing? Let's see how far that water is. I think it's about 25, 30 feet. Yeah, it's a long way down. This, this water's deep. But it's good, Metsy, hey? 
slightly salty. Very slightly salty, but fine. It was, Cattle it's can like... tolerate saltier water than we can. Yes. So that's, that's one of the reasons why, uh, one of the many reasons why the cattle industry has taken off so successfully in this country. They're incredibly hardy animals. They eat, survive on anything. And slightly saline water doesn't bother them at all. Yes, I go. Slightly brackish. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's starting from 19th centuries. When did this one start? Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, it's it's too far away from here. It's, from, it, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's 20 meters deep. Yeah. 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 How do you make this rope? It, 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 it make a, the 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 the, the is the, 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 the skin of, 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 of the car. What part of the car? The, the skin. Oh, skin. Yeah. Oh, skin. I can see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we kill a cow. Yeah. After that, we, we take that skin and we roll it uh, and, and we hang on the tree. Okay. Uh, after after we have, we, we take a, a quick way. Yeah. You see, quick way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We 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 we, 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 uh, 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 we roll. After uh, after after that, uh, uh, we, we come and we. How long? How long do you have to wait for it to dry? Uh, uh, How long? Uh, uh, it's too late. It, it's it's two weeks. Two weeks. Uh, only two weeks. Okay. Yeah. This is how Botswana was, was, was opened up, how the Kalahari was opened up. 100 years, 200 years ago when uh, explorers started coming to this part of Africa, it was a great thirst land and it was a formidable barrier. There was no water, there were no roads, there was no way of getting across it. But the people were here and the great thing is how did the people get here? And these pans are the answer to that question. I find it absolutely fascinating. Because if you can get to a pan like this, notice all these wells around the edges. Yeah, they're, all, they're all on the edge. All Are they all on, on the, the one edge? The one edge of it? So if you can get to a pan like this, the chances are 80, 8 out of 10 that if you dig a hole on the edge of the pan, you'll find fresh water. This water's perfectly fresh. All around or just on one edge? No, no well, it's, it's, it depends. It's it's depends. Yeah. There's no fixed rules, but you'll find water. And that means that when the first people came here, the way they got across the Kalahari was like, like a series of stepping stones from one pan like this to another pan to another pan. And if you could do that, you could cross the whole so-called desert. And the trick was, how would you find a pan? And the secret, the answer to that, is these low hills here. If you, if you can see these, these one, one, two, three, four, five little summits, they happen to be on the south west side of this pan. And the significance of that is this. We think that most of the pans in this country are what are called deflation pans. The wind blows, it hits a hollow, it accelerates as it goes across the hollow, it picks up pieces of dust, moves out of the hollow, slows down and the dust gets dropped. So you get these sand dunes. Typically in this part of the world, you get these sand dunes formed on the side opposite to the prevailing wind. Opposite and wind. we're feeling the wind now. And we're feeling the wind feeling now. The it's wind. coming from the northeast. So there on the southeast, southwest, are these sand dunes. So what? Well, the so what of that is that if you go to the top of those sand dunes and you look in, in the distance, once you get used to, to knowing what you're looking for, you will see other sand dunes. And they're telling you that that's another pan. And if you've got the water and the time to walk to that sand dune, Near it, you'll find a pan. Once you get to that pan, you can dig a hole on the edge like this, find water, and you've taken one step forward into the Kalahari. And the interesting thing is that all the major villages in the Kalahari in Botswana, even today, sit on the side of pans because that's how they were put there in the first place. So when you see these pans here in these little hills, there's so much more to the story than just a rather beautiful feature and some odd hills on one side. They're all the same and they all have this marvelous story. And here they are. In, in almost all of them, you'll find water between 20 and 40 feet below the surface. And these chaps are watering their cattle now in the same traditional way they've been doing it for 200 years or more. This kind of road, is so typical of the Kalahari. So often they're wide, they're flat, and they're quite tricky because they're a mixture of firm 
and soft surfaces. You'll get a firm piece followed immediately by a piece of very soft sand. And they're often, they come up very quickly. So they're often a surprise to the driver. Now the worst thing you can do in such a situation is to brake hard because they're normally a dip and you crash into the dip. If your brakes are on, the nose will be dropped, you'll have less travel on your front suspension and you potentially can do a lot of damage. And the idea is if you want to slow down rapidly, apply brake and then take it off before you hit the ditch. You'll, the nose of the vehicle will lift up and you'll have uh, much more of the suspension to give as you go into the dip. Another dangerous thing is to swerve. Most rollover accidents happen on these roads because of the driver seeing this ditch and swerving and the vehicle then hits it at a slight angle and because it's soft material followed by hard material followed by soft material as the wheels hit the soft material it grabs them and if the vehicle is even moving sideways slightly it will roll onto its roof go straight into the ditch okay and be very gentle with the steering uh, once you're in the soft bit the best thing then is once you're in the soft bit take your foot off the accelerator regain control of the vehicle and then pull out of it the other danger on these calcrete roads calcrete is the white um, almost concrete like material they use to make the roads the dust from oncoming trucks can often hide an overtaking vehicle when you see a truck don't be brave and whiz by slow right down pull right over be patient let him come let him come past and then when the dust clears a bit be on your way and most of all take it easy take take your time try and give yourself lots of time to get from one place to another if you race on these roads you damage your vehicle and, and it can be quite dangerous driving so uh, you know, give yourself a give yourself a lot of time. Your average speed on your on an average calcrete road will be 70 kilometres an hour. Don't expect to do 90 or 100. You won't do it. From the Malopo, we travel west into the sparsely populated dune country of southern Botswana, known to some as the Red Kalahari. In this part of the Kalahari, cattle roam vast areas of grassland. Driving is mostly over bone-rattling sand tracks. In some areas, driving can be rather sedentary, and in others, things hot up nicely. It's left, so you turned left, then you went up over the top and then down quite a steep piece and turned. And as we were going down that steep piece, the back just rolled away. Like that. Well, <laughs> like we were, we were doing nice. nothing, we were just innocent, <laughs> driving along straight. I'd rather go that, that's going getting to be up there is going to be a little more difficult than Much more down difficult, it. yeah. Well, I'm sure there's going to be more of those. This is the area.
straight down. Oh, I believe so. <laughs> Vertical, right there. Oh, wow. But that's quite a sight, eh? Can a car go down there? Yeah. Look how soft it is at the least, on the top of the leaf. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Look at that. So, what's the trick is to keep the car straight as possible and just drop? And accelerate down it. Push the car down the hill. Yeah. Because you don't want the sand underneath the wheels to roll down faster than the car because that'll make it break down. But I'm not going down. No, no. Because getting out the other side is the problem. <laughs> Probably why Let's have a look from the top like here and see what the view like is like on the other side. The beauty of Kalahari travel is that in many parts, including this one, you can camp anywhere. Just find a tree and go and park under it. Once settled and quiet, the desert sounds surround you. Familiar to many a Kalahari traveller are these little guys. The Barking Gecko. Yeah. Into a semicircle. Okay. And they call into the semicircle. They do it deliberately. Okay. And the effect is ventriloquism. So you, it's very, very difficult to tell where the sound is coming from because it bounces all the way okay. off these things. That explains a lot. I've often chased them and never ever. Yeah, they're very <laughs> hard to find. Early the following morning, we head toward one of the most remote cattle posts in the area. Most exciting part about exploring any wilderness area is finally arriving at a destination on a map, which until you arrive is just a name. This is Mara. On the map, it's a dot, a little track running to it, and a name which means nothing until you arrive here. All this place is, and it could have been a town looking at the map, it could have been a settlement, could have been many things. All it is, is a centre where water is pulled from the ground and where the cattle come down off the dunes each day and water themselves. This is the Kalahari, seen as very few see it. In this truly biblical scene, Local cattle herders bring their herds to the only borehole in a hundred square miles. about a place like this, um, what's, what's, what's really striking is the complete absence of any vegetation. And you look at this and you say, ah, oh, this is a real desert. And it's important to realize that a good third of Botswana is like this, except that there aren't this density of cattle and sheep. And it's the cattle and the sheep and the goats that eat away the vegetation, that expose the sand, that makes the sand dunes mobile, just as you see around us now. This is not the way they naturally are. They're like this because the, the vegetation has been eaten away. And you can always tell when you're getting near a village in the, in the Kalahari because suddenly uh, bare sand starts appearing and there's only trees, there's no grass at all. It's all eaten because of the concentration of animals around the water hole, exactly as you have here. I mean, that's quite a sight, isn't it? I mean, it looks for all the world, you could be in a, in a real desert. It isn't at all. It's precisely defined with the perimeter of cows or calves. One there, one there, one over there, one over there. There never seems to be one cow too many for the shade. <laughs> Thank you. 
In this hot environment, everything living seeks shade, including us. And people often will stop underneath a tree just like this, and if you look around, there are thousands of them, and they'll rest and have lunch, or, or sometimes even camp. And there's a problem with doing that, because there is a species of tick in this part of the world. It's not endemic, it's come in from another part of the world. I can't actually remember where it's come from, but it doesn't belong in Southern Africa. It was introduced in the late 19th century. It's called a tampan tick, and it lives in the sand, and so you find it in the Northern Cape and, and in Namibia and here. And it's managed to, the way it lives is in, in the sand, in the shade, uh, the shadow area of a tree. It's just underneath the surface. And it, it lives there, can live there for years without feeding, and it, it's, what it does is it sucks blood from animals that stand in the shade of the tree. Um, most trees in this part here are infected with these animals. They're an absolute plague. They're very difficult to get rid of. Of course, they carry disease like any other ticks, and they're really unpleasant. Um, I, I've, I've got a couple here, and you might like to see these. Mm. We, we were standing here, what, 10 or 15 minutes, yeah. and without any effort, we were able to, to pick up these chaps. And I'm just going to spill them out on here. Not quite sure whether we're going to be able to see them. They're quite repulsive, I have to tell you. Um, there's a little chap here. This one's quite rotund. He's very fast at the moment, and the reason he's rotund is that he's had quite a lot of my blood, uh, and it was him sucking away that alerted me to the fact that we were surrounded by, by these little chaps. One there, one going off at great speed here. There are several quite large ones. Here's a large one pretending to be dead. There's two large ones. Um, they're not going to win any prizes in a beauty competition, I can tell you that. Very hard outside. Live deep underneath the sand to avoid the heat of the day, about 50 centimeters down. What brings them to the surface? Well, some work has been done, and I've understood that it's uh, the gases that, that we exude, CO2 among others. But I'm sure that smell is something. I'm sure that pressure is something. But within 10 minutes of standing in a, underneath a tree, cows, um, cattle, goats, sheep will draw these things to the surface. They'll climb up their legs and they'll attach themselves and start sucking blood. And they have an unusual uh, uh, skill in that the moment the animal starts moving out of the shade, they drop. They let go and drop onto the ground. And if you think of it, if they don't do that, they're going to get left out in the hot sun and they're going to die. Even if they've taken a bite? Hold. Even if they've taken a bite. I remember once um, in Ngami land lying down at the foot of a tree and I, I dozed off to sleep. I was just lying down on the ground. It wasn't particularly sandy, but it was in a cattle area. And I dozed off and I woke up with a sort of uh, tickling sensation on my body. I looked at my arm and I saw two or three ticks standing on my arm. So in horror, I jumped up and I can remember to this day a cascade of, of uh, tampan ticks falling off me. There must have been 20 or 30 of them, quite big chaps. It was a repulsive experience. But they, they are dangerous, as I say, they carry diseases. But more than that, um, there is a case on record where uh, a sick cow stood in the shade of the tree and they completely uh, absorbed all its blood. It died because of a lack of blood. That's a well-recorded case, 1936, somewhere in the Northern Cape. So uh, they're, they're pretty unpleasant creatures. And the, the moral is, don't camp underneath a tree. Someone is climbing up my leg right at this very moment. There he is. Oh, he's quite a big chap. Look at him. There we are. So you can feel them walking up your leg. So be very, very careful about camping underneath trees like this. You've got to, you've got to do it where there are no sheep or goats, and that means not in a settlement or near a settlement. Our route takes us back north now. Mike is taking us towards the Great Makadikadi salt pans, and on the way to the remnants of what he calls the Super Lake that once covered almost all of Botswana. The Makarikari pans are amongst the largest, flattest places on the whole earth and can be easily seen from outer space. This is our first sight of Sour. You... Yeah, this is, this is the place where, for me, the magic of Makarikari begins. Yes. Because as you, you just come out of the village and this is the first sight you get of this incredible feature. 
And it's the first time you begin to understand how enormous the old lake was. That's so a pan that we're looking at now, but you have to understand that where we're standing now is about 949 meters above sea level. But the old lake, the highest level of the old lake, was 945 meters above sea this level. This is the super lake that this covered the, the whole of northern Botswana. It goes from here all the way to Kasani, all the way past Maun, a third of the delta, the whole of Naipan, the whole of Savuti, the whole of Mobabi Depression. You'd have stood here when the lake was at its greatest extent and you'd have seen nothing out there but water. Absolutely nothing at all. And just a few meters away, there's a, an, a, a relic, an old, an ancient shoreline where waves rolled up and smashed on the shore and, 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 and made a beach of pebbles. And they're all rounded. Let's go down and have a look at it. Yeah, it's not very far away. See how they're all rounded? Yes. So this, this was a beach. This was where the waves came in. And they have a fetch of 150 kilometers. They've become pounding in here, great big swells smashing on the shore and then moving these pebbles. Look at them, hundreds of them, all rounded, beautiful, and different stones, all different kinds. It must have been an extraordinary place. Look at this. Yeah, these are beach stones. Yeah, yeah these are all beach stones, exactly. Yeah. Look at them, so typical beach stones. Yeah. And just imagine, imagine being here and, and hearing the sound of the surf rolling all the pebbles, mm. like a pebble beach. Whoops. As, and it's so dry and dusty, there's, it's, it's just such an inhospitable place right now. Yeah. And yet we're standing on the shore of a vast, vast sea. There are layers going down. I yes, that, different, that, exactly. That there are, in fact, layers. There, there are different shorelines because when the lake uh, dried out, it dried out as big rivers were, were captured elsewhere. And so it would stay at this level for a long, long time, then it would drop and stay there for a long, long time. Then it would drop again and, and once more cut a new shoreline. And as it gets smaller and smaller, rain was able to raise and lower the level. So there are a whole series of little shorelines. So as we go down, we actually should cross a series of other... Like going off steps is exactly okay, what well, you will do. Out for that. Yeah. Our convoy reaches Sour Pan, the remnant of the bed of the Super Lake. Driving on the pans is treacherous. Thick black mud lies in wait to catch our vehicles. For this evening though, we're going to take it easy, make camp and early rise to walk up the 400 foot escarpment that lies on the southern edge of Sour Pan. We're at the southern tip of Sour Pan and along the southern edge of the pan are some very high hills. They're much higher than anything else for quite some distance. And this is actually a national archaeological site, the top of this hill. And we're going to take a walk up there and I believe Mike tells us that there are a few surprises to find. <music> made it up the hill. It's quite a climb. If you're fit, unlike me, you probably won't find it too difficult. But down there it looks like a hill. Up here it's immediately apparent it's not a hill at all. This is an escarpment and it drops sharply away just to the southern edge of Sour Pan. What are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for, well here's what I'm looking for. That's exactly what I was looking for. Can you see that? This piece there? Yep. That yeah, that round, round thing. That round thing? Yeah, that's an ostrich eggshell bead, and it's a particularly fine one. And it's very, very small, very delicate. Very well made. Pretty good, considering that was made without the use of iron, and probably a thousand years ago. What is that telling us about this place? Well, the, the, this, is a, this is an archaeological site, so I know that it's a, it's a village, 
I know that uh, probably a thousand people lived here. Around that number we can't possibly tell. And we know from work that has been done here that it was occupied somewhere around 1000 AD, 1200 AD. That's 800 years ago. This is a, a midden, what we would call a midden. And if you go to every, any African village today, you'll see that they keep the place scrupulously clean and all the detritus that they sweep up gets taken to a place and thrown away outside the fence. And that, of course, accumulates over time and gets buried in time. And then uh, we come and dig it up a thousand years later. And every hut will have its own midden or every collection of huts, and this is a midden. And I can tell that because, first of all, I can see the greyish colour of the soil. Secondly, there's lots of stuff here. There's, two, two there's beads, beads here. Uh, there's another bead there. Yeah. Um, there's pieces of bone here. There's a piece of bone. There's another piece of bone. There's another piece of bone. I picked up a very... There's a lovely piece of bone. See it? Oh, right. Yes, it is indeed. Uh, and, of course, hundreds of pieces of pottery. So here's something interesting. See this this stone. Mm -hmm. What do you notice about this stone? Round. Exactly. And it's clearly been in water. Mm. It's 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 been rolled and rolled and rolled in water, and it's completely smooth, and and uh, rounded. Uh, and we look around here and we think to ourselves, wait a moment, we're 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 three or four hundred feet above the, the old lake. Yes. Yes. How did this get here? This is sandstone that we're standing on, and above it was basalt, not water. This must have been brought here by people. What was it used for? Why did they bring it? Well, as it happens, even today, if you go to the remoter areas and you watch women making pots, they use rounded stones like this or uh, mussel shells, the, the local equivalent, whatever it is, to shape and smooth the inside of the pot. They put that, this in their fingers and they will use a rounded stone. Okay. Oops, I've dropped it because I'm not very good at making pots. Um, and they'll use this to smooth the inside of the pot. Is that and so right? somebody a thousand years ago, 800 years ago, was using this to smooth their pots. Amazing, isn't <laughs> it? This is obviously a wall, Mike. Yeah. What, what is this wall? Well, uh, we can only speculate, but it's surprising to find a wall like this in this environment. And uh, I think the suspicion would be that this marks, this is a formal structure that marks the formal entry to this site. And down in this river, uh, in this valley here, there's a river. It's perhaps where they drew water. There's a well-worn path uh, up this valley, and it comes through a gap in the wall there and uh, leads us to this point here. And I suspect that, that this is a formal statement. Here is an important place, and people coming here would come up through this wall, and there would well have been, perhaps been a hut here, a kind of guardian who was the person that you approached. Um, we don't know the date of this wall, but the site we know, and this could be an early example of one of the first uses of stone as a formal statement. And where would the stone have come all from? All of this, this is all sandstone, it all would have come from around here somewhere. Okay. And the wall is much degraded now, but there's every reason to think that it would have been quite neat and, 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 and smart and well built when it was uh, in use. The other wall is much more impressive. Onto Kubu Island, the only regularly visited part of Sawapan. Just arrived at Kubu Island on the western side of Sawapan. Every time I come here, I am in awe of the place. It is just something extraordinary. This is a national heritage site, archaeological site. Probably the only place in the Makarikari that is regularly visited by self-drive tourists. But it is an extraordinary place and 
if you ever visit the Makari Kari, make your way to Kubu. First thing one sees in Kubu is the Great Wall. It's obviously a wall, yeah. and it's in a semicircle. Yeah. This stone wall structure in front of us is what is often called the Lost City. It is neither a city nor is it lost, but it is a really interesting uh, structure. Right. It's about 200 meters long, and uh, it's, it's really fairly mysterious because, in fact, we don't know a great deal about it. We know that it's post-Great Zimbabwe, that means it was built after 1450. Informed opinion puts it around 1600, 1650, but that's a guess. Um, one might expect that uh, people were living inside this wall. There are very clearly defined entrances, there are loopholes, holes in the wall, very typical of similar structures in Zimbabwe. But the curious thing is there's not a trace of inhabitation inside this wall. There's no pottery, there are no beads, there's nothing to say uh, that people lived in here. In fact, there's everything to say that people never lived in here. And that raises the question, what was it all about? And, and it's, it's, is it significant that it goes from one shore to the other? Is it a barrier of some kind? It could it... well be a barrier. We can only speculate. We don't really know. But it, it, it's not an accident that it goes from one shore to the other. That's for certain. So How it's enclosing one... a portion of the island. You're saying that the people wouldn't dwell here, but they'd obviously use it for something. They would have used it is for something. Is there no indication of what they might have used well, it for? Well, it's interesting that you should ask that, because there is an indication, and again, informed opinion takes the evidence that perhaps I can show you a little later, and puts it together with this structure, and comes up with a really interesting explanation for this that makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. A possible clue to the, the use of that enclosed area, that walled area that yeah. we've just seen, is right here. So let's go and have a look at that. There are curious features like this stone can in front of you. See this yeah. rounded shape here? There's another one over there. There's another one over there. And they're completely mysterious. People at first thought they might have been graves, but the museum has excavated two of them and there is nothing underneath them. And the possibility exists, and we can only speculate on this, but the possibility exists that uh, many African tribes have initiation ceremonies, and in some parts of Africa, those initiation ceremonies which might take place every two or three years and mop up if you like all the youngsters of suitable age 16 17 18 down to perhaps 15 and they would go to a place that is remote they would have their initiation ceremony and some tribes mark that ceremony with a cairn of rocks we don't know if that's the case here but it's a very likely explanation especially when you think of the fact that there are nearly 200 cairns like this on Kubu Island. That's a lot of them. And it suddenly it puts into perspective a possible use of the ruins that we saw earlier on. Remember, there's, there's no sign of anybody living in that area, although there are other sites on this island where people clearly did live at a different time span. But there's no pottery in there, there's no hut bases, there's nothing to suggest people lived there. So what was it used for? And the implication is that it might have been the place where initiation ceremonies were held and that these cairns, these 200 odd cairns that litter this island, you can see them standing all mm -hmm. the way up the hill yeah. slope and over the other yeah. side, yeah. they in some way mark or commemorate those ceremonies. We've, we've, we've 
walked into this, it's an, obviously an enclosure mm. overlooking the pans. Mm -hmm. And this is where we found, where you found the evidence of human habitation. Yeah, there's, there's evidence on the way up here and there's evidence here. There's pottery and um, eggshell beads. But the most significant thing in, in where we are now is this rock and this pottery, which was here when we got here. And what it tells me is that it just underlines for me the, the, the time dimension of this island. It doesn't exist for a moment when you arrive here as a tourist and you look at it and you leave. It's part of the culture of the people. It has been for not just generations, but for thousands of years. And what this is saying, this is where the local people are trying to make contact with their ancestors and through the medium of potty, pottery, which they know is used by people who were here before them. So through this, sometimes through eggshell beads, which they will put in here as well. And as a measure of their sincerity and earnestness, they will often put down a few of the local coins. And when you consider how poor these people are, for them to leave a one pula coin here or 25 tebe coin here is a measure of how really important it is to them. So this rock is used today, mm -hmm. what it was used for a thousand years ago when this place was inhabited. Can't that say that it was saying? no, can't say that it was used for this purpose a thousand years ago, but we can say that modern people see the evidence of, of settlement, uh, okay. see the pottery lying around, know that this place has a huge time depth of occupation right. and see it as a way of communicating with their ancestors. Okay. That makes sense? Yep, yeah, absolutely. And and when you look at the, the setting it's and you think about this island as a whole and the, the um, cairns that we've seen and the stone wall site that we've seen, you begin to understand this is not just an isolated pretty island, this is a really important place and it has a time depth of occupation which is enormous, it goes right back for as long as man has been in Africa. We're now on the summit of Kubu. Well. We're standing about 9, 20 meters above sea level, about uh, 11 meters above the surrounding pan. And what the story is here is these smooth granite rocks tell us that at one stage this place exactly where we're standing was a tiny little islet um, emerging from this vast sea. And that around them waves were crashing onto these rocks waves that started 140 kilometers away and had a long, long fetch and were probably quite big. And uh, they crashed onto the rocks here, surged around it and would have moved any material that was movable up and down, creating a pebble beach. And in fact, just behind me here on the, on the ground down here, there are thousands of rounded stones that, have, that are clear evidence of a pebble beach that marked like a tonsure, a, a circle around this single rock. And had you stood here when the lake was present, except for the escarpment that you can see in the background, apart from that, you would have seen nothing but water in every direction that you know. It would have been extraordinary to be here at that time. How long ago would that have been? Hard here? to say, thousands of years for certain. Certainly more than, probably more than 10,000 years. But it was a very big sea. At its biggest extent, that, that lake, this lake, um, would have covered 120,000 square kilometers. Whole of northern Botswana, Okavango, Savuti, parts of the Chobe, all underwater. And, and this, this, this little tiny island this here, would have been, would have, <laughs> you and I would, would have, have been standing been, here been. saying it's a bit cold and we're getting wet from the spray, but gosh, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we're going to do now is something a little bit risky. Due south from Kubu are two islands. They're called South Islands. It's 10 kilometers across open pan. Mike reckons it'll be fine. Personally, I'm a little bit nervous, but we're gonna do it anyway. See you on South Island. So it's goodbye Kubu. We will see you again sometime in South Island. See it ahead. Uh, it actually looks quite scary. This it's a very, very big piece of pan. But Mike is very experienced in his pans, probably more experienced than anybody. 
So, oh, here we go. Into here yonder. we go into the wild blue yonder. Straddling these tracks and actually looks quite good. We have, uh, how far are we across? Not quite halfway. The steering becomes so sensitive. Keeping the steering wheel dead, dead straight. Not stink sinking in much. About halfway now. Look at that. What she's doing, what, what he's doing. The, uh, the they've, got, they've got a yeah. nest up here. Yeah. One of them has gone off that way, and that one is pretending to have a broken wing, and getting us to follow her because, or him, it's a hack, because they think that uh, we're predators, and we're after so after something to eat. So she, that he's trying to distract us and make make us follow him and take us away from the nest, which is in here somewhere. That's quite something to see that. Typical driving in the Makati Kari, absolutely beautiful. You go across the pan, it's all kunky dory, and suddenly the vehicle gets sucked in. And this is what happens. The mud is very sticky and it sticks absolutely everywhere. Look at this here. It's been forced. See, look at this. Unbelievable. Now that piece that I drove through now was probably less than 100 meters, probably 50 meters. And it, during that time, when you hit it, you can't turn the steering wheel. You have to keep the steering wheel absolutely straight. The vehicle will not turn. And even if you turn it slightly, you can feel the power being absorbed and the vehicle wants to slow down. So keep it in a low gear. And when that happens, open the throttle and keep clear. Get out of the soft patch. It's really the only way of, of apart from avoiding it completely, getting out of it. The other thing to consider, if you're lucky enough to be driving with another vehicle, don't drive in that vehicle's tracks, but straddle them. You'll be able to read the thickness of the, of, of the, of the mud, if there is any, by the vehicle in front of you's tracks. The other thing is that if you want to cross to an island or something like that, and you actually do have to cross a section of pan, look out for cattle tracks. The cows here seem to have a sixth sense about what is soft and what is isn't it, what isn't. And if you see cattle tracks, even if they're fairly old, there's a reasonable chance that that is the safest way across. Now we are now being blinded by the dust because Mark's gone right. While there was the wind, it seems to have, it's blowing in our faces, that's the thing. <laughs> Tell me that is not incredible colors. <laughs> <laughs> We made it! Yeah.
<laughs> one or two patches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> did I throw up any mud? Uh, no, you didn't. No, I yeah, only threw up in the car. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, look at this place. Look, look at the colours. Look at the, look at the colours here. And this, this combination of gold and brown and, and black is just incredible. dark blue band just above the horizon and it's got pink above it. That is the shadow of our Earth on our atmosphere. It's the shadow of planet Earth. The sun's setting down in the west and as it goes down so the Earth gets thrown into, into it goes into darkness and the sun throws a shadow beyond the Earth and that's it and if you watch it carefully you will see it gradually rising up across the sky until finally it's completely night. It's not often that you can see it that clearly. It's rather a nice picture of it. 